Hello, everybody, and welcome back to week three of our course on critical reading. I hope everyone's having a good week and a good Labor Day weekend. If you've been able to get out and go do something, uh, that's great. So what I want to start off doing this week is talking about your first major writing assignment in this class, uh, the summary assignment, which I mentioned earlier in the first lecture when we were going over the course syllabus. But now we're going to go over it in more detail. And the summary assignment will be due uh, two weeks from today. So you have two weeks to work on this. This first assignment, it's not super complex or in-depth, so hopefully you shouldn't have too much trouble with it. Uh, and you should have access to the assignment description and guidelines on our Canvas page too, in the same module as you found this uh, lecture in. But I want to go ahead and read it over with you here in the lecture too, uh, just because some people retain information better from hearing it than from reading it. But if you want to uh, pull up your summary assignment and follow along as I'm reading at the same time, that's fine too. But I'm going to pull it up here and just kind of read off, this, read off the uh, sheet and... Then, of course, if you have any questions on this, you can always email me and ask for clarifications and let me know. So, I have the assignment description and guidelines pulled up here. And we'll begin. So, this is your first writing assignment in critical reading. And it starts off by um, imagining you to picture that you've been chosen to describe a text whether it be a book, an essay, article, or even a multimodal text, such as a documentary or a podcast. Uh, imagine that you've been chosen to describe one of those to someone who's never heard of it before. Also imagine that you're rushed for time, or that the medium through which you are communicating with this person has specific constraints, such as on Twitter, where you only have a certain amount of characters to get your point across. When this happens, you have to make a couple of important decisions right away about what to say. What gets included? What gets left out? What does the person that you're speaking with absolutely need to know? In other words, you would need to know how to effectively summarize the thing that you are trying to describe. And I might say that a lot of us have had this experience if we've ever tried to describe a movie or a book that we really liked to a friend or a family member. You want to tell them about the cool parts or the parts that stuck out to you, but you also have to tell them enough so that they understand the setup for those cool parts. They have to know actually what the point of the movie or the book was about, who the characters were. You're summarizing a two-hour story into a brief uh, aside in a conversation. So the purpose of a summary is to describe an article or a book's main point and the most important details. Because of their length, writing a summary may seem deceptively simple, but there is actually quite an art to it. You are required to thoroughly understand the text that you are summarizing, which means probably reading it through at least two or three times, so that you can deliver a distilled version of it in your own words. And when I say this, resist the temptation to paraphrase rather than summarize. This is the difference between hearing what the text is about and hearing the text itself recited back and recited back in slightly different words. So this is one thing that I see a lot in these summary assignments where someone will just basically restate the story in their own words without actually summarizing what the story was about. It's okay to have a little bit of paraphrasing there if you're trying to get across a main idea of something that happened in it. But you do want to have a summary where you're getting a sort of bird's eye view of things, if that makes sense. You're not just rephrasing what happened. You're going over what happened from a bird's eye view, getting the summary, the overall picture of things. So you will need to make connections between everything that the author is saying and derive the implicit thesis or purpose of the text from these connections. The danger, perhaps especially given that some of the essays in Cohen's anthology are short essays, lies in writing a summary that's too long. Summaries really shouldn't be as long as the text itself, otherwise, what's the point, right? 
So keep this in mind when selecting the essay from Cohen's anthology that you would like to summarize. And also, when the summaries get too long, that's when that uh, danger of paraphrasing instead of summarizing creeps in because you're trying to fill up space, so you end up re-saying things that the author actually already said in the story. So on that point of selecting the essay that you want to use for this assignment, I'm allowing you uh, for this first essay, for this first writing assignment, to pick the essay that you want to work with. So hopefully you have Cohen's Anthology by now, and if not, hopefully you've at least been able to access some of the essays that I've asked you to read from our syllabus online somewhere on Google as a PDF. So flip through here and you can use one of the essays that we've already read, or you can use an essay that looks interesting to you that we haven't talked about yet. And pick which one you want to use for your summary, which one you want to summarize, and that'll be the one that you go with. And if you haven't looked through the table of contents of this Cohen's anthology yet, you can see that it actually gives a couple different versions of the table of contents. It gives you the linear one by the page number. It gives you a table of contents by purpose. So there's this, and then you can see which essays are kind of personal essays, which ones are argumentative. And then it also gives you a table of contents by theme. So if you know that you're interested in, for example, ethics or family, those are the essays that are going to be talking about that. And so this should help you uh, narrow down which essay you want to use for this summary assignment by going through these different table of contents uh, sections and deciding what one looks good to you, which one you want to take some time going over and reading. Or like I said, you can choose to summarize one of the ones that we've already talked about, the Stephen King essay, the Malcolm X essay, um, etc. So once you've picked which essay you're going to work with to summarize, um, this is what all of your summarize should include by the time you're finished. Um, they need to have identifiers such as the text's name, the text's author, and when it was published and where it first appeared. Now, this might seem like a pretty standard requirement to have in a summary, but you'd be surprised in the past uh, how many people have kind of forgotten to include that. Again, picture when you're writing this assignment that you're trying to explain one of these essays to somebody who has no clue what they're about. So you want to make sure that you get in the basics, what their name is, uh, when they were writing. And in this anthology, most of the essays have all of this information in sort of uh, italics at the start of the essay. It tells you where it first appeared, if it came out in a magazine, or if it's an excerpt from a longer book. And so you should be able to get that most of that information right off of the first page of whatever essay it is that you pick to summarize. Another thing that your assignment should have is at least two direct quotes from the essay to support your claim, or at least to support your statement of what the main idea is or what the thesis is. So use at least two direct quotes. You can use more if you want, but don't overcrowd the summary. Again, this is an assignment that by its nature, by its genre, is supposed to be kind of short, kind of brief, but the two quotes will at least show that you're using evidence from the text just to support whatever it is that you're saying that the essay is about. Also, refrain from including your own thoughts and opinions in a summary. So sentences that start with expressions such as, I agree with blank, or I don't like blank, or it wasn't convincing to me. Uh, thoughts like these are best expressed in reviews, which are albeit they're related, they are distinct from summaries. And a review is going to be what our next assignment is in a couple of weeks. So the summary isn't really a document that includes what you think about whatever essay it is that you're summarizing. It's just giving you the facts. And finally, uh, this assignment needs to be at least one full page. Make sure that you're writing in 12-point 
Times New Roman or a similar font. Really, it's just more important that you keep it at 12 point and have it double spaced. So again, it's not the longest assignment. It shouldn't take you too long to uh, go through this. Although you should take your time reading whichever essay it is that you choose to work with. Like I said earlier, um, reading it two, sometimes even three times will give you a good enough grasp of what the, at what the essay is for you to be able to summarize it succinctly. So this assignment will be due on Monday, September 21st at 8 o'clock a.m., which is usually when the next module of classes for that week are released, and it's worth 12.5 points. So again, uh, if you have any questions on that assignment, please don't hesitate to email me. Let me know. You've got two weeks to work on it. So don't feel that you have to jump into it right away over Labor Day weekend, but definitely start thinking about which essay you want to work with. Okay, so for the rest of this week's lecture, I want to get into uh, the first step of critical reading, which we've talked about already, and that's uh, pre-reading. And pre-reading is, let me exit out of that assignment first. Okay, there we go. So the first step of critical reading is pre-reading. And so pre-reading is something that can be done separately from critical reading. Some people, you might say, are only pre-readers. Um, they pick up a book and do these certain exercises or steps that we're going to be covering and then put it down and think that they've read the book, uh, which isn't exactly a good thing to do. You do want to eventually get to the stage of critical reading. But when we think of reading as something that takes place in stages or steps, there is that first step of pre-reading and then you move on to critical reading after it. So we can define pre-reading for the purposes of this class as a series of different exercises that help you to learn as much about a text as possible without reading it all the way through. So when might it be a good idea to pre-read? Well, in the university, uh, especially in a class such as English 102, which eventually you'll take because it's a required class, you're going to be doing a lot of research. Uh, maybe you've done research papers before. I know that in the high school I went to, we had the senior research paper, which was kind of like a year-long project where we got all these sources and learned how to do citations and things like that. And projects like that will come up for you often in many of your classes. Maybe they already have, maybe you've already done something like this. But when you're doing lots of research and you're on a time schedule, when you have uh, re restrictions on actually how long you can spend looking through different sources, looking for the right ones to use in your research papers, it's good to be able to know how to get through a lot of books quickly. So say, for example, in English 102, you're writing an essay that asks you to use 10 different sources. Well, <clears throat> you probably know what your subject's going to be right away, and that narrows it down somewhat, but not really, because you can walk into the library at UIS or even go onto the library's webpage and see that there's probably hundreds of books on whatever subject it is that you're going to be doing research on. So because there's not really any time to go through all 100 of those books, you want to be able to figure out quickly, like within a minute or two, or sometimes 10 minutes, which book would be good for you to actually spend more time on uh, for your research. So you can have that stack of 100 books, pick one up, tell right off the bat that it's not one you're going to be able to use and not waste any more time on it. But then when you pick up a book and you do these pre-reading techniques, and you realize, okay, this sounds like something that's gonna be worth my while, something I might use in my research paper, then you can check that book out or set it aside and dedicate more of your time to reading it more thoroughly. And that's where the critical reading stage comes in. So pre-reading is, you can think about it as a time-saving device. And there's mul multiple different exercises or tricks to pre-reading. We're going to talk about some of them now, and then we're going to talk about some more of them in next week's lecture. So the first step that I want to kind of go over with you is to, 
I say jokingly, judge a book by its cover. So there's a lot of things that you can tell about a book without even opening it up. You can tell it just by the cover or the back cover. And I have a book here as an example. It was one that I read a couple weeks ago called The Library. So take a look at this book and take a guess at what it might be about from the cover itself. And no, this isn't a trick question. It's pretty obvious with this one anyway, that it's going to be a book about a library of some sort. The title itself, though, doesn't tell us if it's going to be a work of fiction. You know, maybe it's a fantasy story about a magical library, something like that, the library from Beauty and the Beast. Or is it uh, nonfiction? Is it talking about a specific historical library? Well, the title doesn't give us that clue, but uh, the subtitle kind of does. And that's another thing you can look at right away if the title doesn't give you enough information. Is there a subtitle? So we get the subtitle, A Catalog of Wonders. So a catalog is kind of like a list or a series of different items that have been compiled together. It kind of gives us the idea that this isn't really a fiction story. It's going to be a list of it says wonders but we can make the connection there that it's a list of different libraries and that is in fact what this book is about it's a couple it, each chapter tells about a sort of famous library in history from the ancient libraries and the library of alexandria up to the modern day ones like the library of congress and we can also look at the cover design again I kind of picked this book because it would be self-evident. We can see that it's actually a picture of a library. It's actually a photograph of, a, oh, I can't remember the name of that library off the top of my head. It's in Ireland. Um, but yeah, it's a well-known library. So we got the title, the subtitle, the cover design. Uh, always look to see if the book has any blurbs or quotes from other famous authors on it. That'll tell you whether or not it's worth your time. If an author can get another author or a news magazine to comment favorably on their writing, they'll definitely take the opportunity to slap that comment on the front cover. So maybe you can take it sort of for granted that a book that has a bunch of quotes from uh, different book reviews or different authors is going to be more worth your time to read in depth than a book that just has a blank cover with no qu quotes, no recommendations, or anything like that on it. And so we can see on the front of this, on the top of this cover, we it says "excellent tracks the history of that greatest of all cultural institutions, the library," and it's from the Washington Post. And there's more on the back. So this is a book that's been reviewed favorably, not just by one media outlet, but by other ones. We have a review from the New York Times that says the library abounds in fascinating tales. Another one from the National that says a thread of wonder runs throughout these pages, weaving in and out of the subject of libraries in general. And so if you're looking at a huge stack of books while you're going through some sort of research project or essay, you always it's always a good idea to pick it up and get those quotes to just see what other people are saying about it. What is the blur what are the blurbs choosing to highlight? And then of course, not every book, but most books actually have a good summary of what it's about on the back cover or on the inside jacket cover, things like that. And so I would encourage you, um, if while you're watching this, you have some other school textbook near you, or if you just have some a book of your own near you, to pick it up and take a minute, look at it, and see what the cover is telling you. Uh, what does the title say? What does the design of the cover tell you? Is it going to be something exciting or interesting? I can look here and see... Hmm. What's a good example? Here's a book by an author that we're actually going to be reading later on in the semester, Oliver Sacks, and it's called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat and Other Clinical Tales. So 
Oliver Sacks was a psychologist and he sort of compiled all these different stories about the um, not really absurd, but strange cases that he's had of clients coming in that he's had to deal with. But um, we can tell from the cover of this book that it's not going to be something with lots of explosions and excitement. Fantasy books or science fiction books usually tend to advertise that they are science fiction or fantasy books because they'll have maybe somebody with a sword on the cover or things of that nature. But this book is a fiction book. It's just a psychologist recounting some different clients that he's helped out. And so it's kind of a plain cover. There's not a lot here that jumps out and gets your attention or catches the eye. So those are all things you can look for on the cover itself. Again, this one's about a library. And this rule applies better in some cases than it does to others. So our 50, 50 Essays Anthology, they got a little photograph here of a bunch of hot air balloons rising up into the sky in the desert. I don't really know what that has to do with any of the 50 essays that we're going to read. Um, and it doesn't really have anything to do with it. So the cover design for our anthology doesn't really give away too much of what's going on, except for the kind of self-evident name, 50 Essays. So we know that there's going to be 50 essays. Speaking of the summary that we can see on the back cover of some of these books, you can also read the summary of a book on diff in different places. For example, um, Amazon. If you shop for books on Amazon, you can usually read a summary of what the book's about. And you can also read the reviews on Amazon too. So that's always good to know if the book's going to be helpful. Just go to Amazon, scroll down, and see what other people who have read it are saying about it. And people can be brutally honest in reviews, especially online reviews. If it's a book that really didn't appeal to them or that they didn't like, they'll let you know. They'll give it one star or half star and say it's a complete waste of time. The author doesn't know what they're talking about. Things like that. Or if they liked it, you know, they'll be honest about that too. Another way to get an idea of what the book's about without actually opening it is look up and see if there's a Wikipedia article about it. Um, this won't be true for more shorter works, like most of our essays wouldn't have a Wikipedia article, but if you're having to read a work of fiction, for example, like say Lord of the Rings or Oliver Twist, you can look up the Wikipedia article for those books and read the summary at a glance and get a good sense of what's going on in that 500, 600 page work in about two or three minutes. But keep in mind that the reviews and summaries on Amazon and the Wikipedia summaries are all doing what you're being asked to do for the first writing assignment in this class. They're effective summaries. They're telling people who don't know anything about the book what's going on in it, why it's worth their time to read it. So it's a responsibility in a, in a way to make sure that you're covering the important things. You're stating what the thesis is, or the main idea, or even if it's a work of fiction, what the theme might be. And then you're going over <clears throat> who the different characters are, if it's fiction, or what the different main points were, if it was nonfiction, how the book is organized. Is it a book like The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, that's kind of telling stories, or is it a book that's more analytical that has charts and data, graphs, things like that. So think about how to effectively summarize a work, especially with the uh, two readings for this week, which are both, well, at least one is. The Mike Rose essay is a little bit longer than the other ones that we've read. Mike Rose, I just want to be average. That would be a good essay to, uh, practice summary on because it's a good length. He covers a lot of things and there's some subtopics that creep into his essay. So you might notice that his main idea or his main point of writing is talking about the education system in a lot of ways, but he does bring other stuff into it. 
So it's a good essay to practice sort of piecing out what's really important to it and keeping that and then doing away with some of the side stuff, some of the, you don't want to say filler, but for the purposes of this, yeah, let's say filler. The other essay for this week, uh, similar, it's not as long though. Yeah, The Joy of Reading and Writing Superman and Me by Sherman Alexie. He's a good writer, kind of a funny writer, and hopefully you'll enjoy that one too. So yeah, that's what I have for this week. Um, start thinking about the summary assignment and practice this pre-reading technique on books that you have for other classes. Um, what can you tell about the book just from the cover, just from the author's the author blurbs, the quotes on the back of it, uh, things like that. Okay, so uh, again, let me know if you have any questions. So far, everything's going good on our Canvas site. I've really enjoyed reading your responses to the discussion prompts and the reading reflections. I'm responding to as many of them as I can. I probably won't respond to everyone every week, but I will make an effort to make sure that everybody hears my reaction to your thoughts at least you know, every other week or so. So uh, have a good weekend and I will see you next time.